Hi, everybody. Welcome to Conversations with Lynn McTaggart. And I have an amazing guest and friend on with me today. You already know who he is. He is probably the most influential relationship counselor and writer of all time. He's the best-selling author of the amazing book, Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus, the book that changed forever our ideas about relationships. He's gone on to write a whole host of best-selling books. He is also a counselor. He is a health professional. He knows probably as much about health and holistic health as we do with What Doctors Don't Tell You, and I'm thrilled to say he's a dear friend. So welcome, John. Uh, Lynn, it's so nice to see you. It's been a while. <laughs> I <New> know. <laughs> We are good. I just, I'm sorry, I'm a few minutes late, everybody. I just saved my granddaughter from potentially falling down the stairs. So it, she was after some jewelry of mine and <laughs> and then went for a beeline to the stairways. So anyway, the uh, trials and tribulations and wonders of being a grandmother. But we've had such interesting parallel lives, John, in lots of ways. And I thought this would be a really interesting conversation for us to dive deep into intentional relationships and relationships in general, particularly difficult ones. But first of all, I have to say, John and I, as I said, have parallel lives in lots of ways. We're about the same age, but also we have had, mine's currently going on, marriages lasting very long time. You with Bonnie, 34 years, and now I know Bonnie has passed and a few years ago, and you are happily remarried. But I'm going to talk about the longevity of that marriage. And I've also been married for 33 years, coming up to 34 this year, too. And so a lot of people want to know, at this time, what makes for a happy marriage? How did we do it? So I'm going to well, start with you. I think where we are so aligned is it's all about intention. Uh, you know, it's skills, it's insights. You know, the eyes of men from the ideas of men from Mars, women from Venus, save me, save my wife, without a doubt. Uh, because when you don't understand what your partner needs, where they're coming from, what's the most effective way to provide the calm and support that they require to feel the ease of relationships. So that was very important. But, you know, it's fun for me to talk with you, Lynn, because you're all about intention. And when I teach my classes, I always say, now, look, the most important thing here is we set our intention to be more loving and to always come back to love. There's no excuse. There's just in my mind, there's no excuse. I can throw my tantrum. I do it privately until I come back to a place of love. And then I come give that love. It's like a commitment and, you know, I do a lot of things to boost my commitment. One is, my gosh, I spent my whole life studying relationships. If I can't make it work, who can? So <laughs> there's a place inside, which is you got to figure this out. You got to make it work. It's not like it was always easy. You know, my books all talk about the challenges I've had and how I overcame them with insight, with understanding. And that's all good, but it's not good enough unless you have that intent that, my commitment is to always come back to a place of forgiveness, a place of, in Christian term, repentance, uh, to acknowledge I made a mistake. I'm part of this problem. It's never I'm the victim. I can feel like the victim because we're emotional beings. Anytime you have an, a negative emotion, when you get triggered, it, you, you're a victim for a little while. So I have to hold that in a context of that's my lower self. The one way that's my emotional self. That's my childlike self has no emotional control. It just comes up. Let me manage that until I come back to a place of taking responsibility for my side of any challenge or difficulty. And then what I find is with patience, my partner will always reciprocate. It always comes back. And sometimes she's the first one to do that and with patience. She giving me a lot of love can always pull me out of my cave. <laughs> I, I love that idea because I think at the heart of it is we are going to get along no matter what. And if you do have that commitment, 
we are going to find a place of connection no matter what. That is really at the heart of it, isn't it? And most people give up or they get positional. I find it's really interesting um, when I teach about relationships with intention. I find one of the problems we have these days is that we have to be right. And we expect everybody else to agree with us all the time, particularly our partner. And we, we find it incredibly difficult when somebody has a different point of view. Not only do we think they're crazy, but we also have to demonize them and we have to tell the world about it. And we of course see that in the wider context of the polarization going on now, you know, whether it's you're a Republican and I'm a Democrat, whether it is you had one view about COVID, I had another, whether you are pro-vaccination, anti-vaccination, pro-Brexit, anti-Brexit, all of that now has become so polarized that there's only a sense of I'm right, you're wrong. And so one of the things I found in relationships is it's really important. Well, of course, it's very important to listen, but also to be fluid about maybe I'm not always right. Yeah. <laughs> My whole thing is if I'm upset, like I have a men's group, all right. And I'm I'm so I mean, I've been meditating 50 years. I'm made my marriage work great. You know, I have an equanimity and a love and a joyfulness in my life. And in my men's group, they all know I'm always cool about everything. But one day when that COVID thing was going on and they all got their shots, I got so mad at them. <laughs> and, they, and by mid, they all said, oh, John, I think you're overreacting. And then I started laughing. Absolutely. Whenever we're upset, we're overreacting. And we have, even though there's reasons to be, uh, resistant to things in the world to avoid certain things there's no doubt about resistance is a part of life nobody can just walk all over me whatever but i don't need to roar up into anger in order to set resistance it's that well i disagree <laughs> it's not my thing and that that tendency to be right i remember years ago i had another way in my mind i would reframe it okay right now i am right no question about it but it's not going to do anything unless i do the right thing and what is doing the right thing? So I shift my whole thing from I'm right to let me do the right thing. And 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 then I could sort of be right by doing the right thing. Because we do want to be right. You know, when you're wrong, people will think, well, why do I want to hire you? Or why would I want to be with you? So there's a reason to be right, to have a position. And, you know, I'm always in my messages. I'm always trying to give the best message I can and be right. And when, but there's nothing wrong with it, but in a relationship when there's tension and we have to remember, this is the person who loves you. This is the person you sought them out. <laughs> you have this wonderful experience together. What went wrong? It's always so easy when the emotions are involved, the emotions will always say it's the other person's fault. Sometimes for a person whose tendency is to be neurotic, it's always their, their fault. So you can't say it's always that way, but generally speaking, when there's conflict in a relationship, I'm right, you're wrong. <laughs> and one of the distinctions that's very helpful when we look at the male and female sides of us is the male side of us always, uh, well, particularly, let me do the right thing is particularly good for the male side. But for the for the female side, if I'm doing the right thing, what I want to do is give her the right to feel what she feels. Okay, so there's one thing is do the right, be the right, and have the right to women really, really need, if they want to produce the right hormonal, healthy balance in their body, the right to feel what they feel. That doesn't mean I, oh, I agree with what they feel, but they have the right to feel that way. And there's a reason they feel that way. And if you have a superficial understanding of emotions, they're crazy. They're overreacting. They're being irrational. But if you have a, a, a deeper understanding of emotions, emotional intelligence, we realize that if I've had 15 things go wrong today, then my partner does something that would normally upset me a little, it's gonna upset me 10 times more. That's called displacement. This is a very simple con con psychological concept. If you've had a bad day, or my favorite thing is if you have a toothache, it's really hard to be patient. <laughs> when you're in pain, <laughs> it's hard to be patient. You know, you'll be irritable, you'll be grumpy. And your brain will, you're no longer functioning from the prefrontal cortex. You're just a, a reactive being. And 
that's a stress response. So accumulated stress of the day will cause us to overreact in our relationships. And then let's say you have a, a great life, uh, like you won the lottery, that's always the best example. When people go win the lottery, they also go crazy. What's that about? Okay, they're, they're happy for a moment, but when you're happy and you feel like, oh, no, I, I don't have to, I can be whoever I wanna be, I can be myself. As soon as they feel I can be myself, then all of the suppressed feelings from your childhood will start to come up. And that's why there's so many, so many rich people who go to go to rehab <laughs> and have so many divorces and so forth, because they no longer have to sort of hold themselves down in order to get approval, to get money, to be, survive. But once those things go away, our needs become different. And we have to learn how to process those emotions that will come up. So we tend to be arrogant. Uh, I, I just, one example, because theory is one thing, er, experience is another. I remember when I finally got this many, many years ago, but I got to the place where I earned enough money to fly first class. And a long time ago, first class was 10 times more than economy, flying from LA to New York. So, <laughs> so I got my first class seat. It was just perfect. These lessons come to me. And so I'm really proud of myself. I feel like, okay, I'm in the upper class now. I'm going to sit in the first class seat. And I went to my seat and a woman was in it. And I thought, oh, I'll just talk to the flight attendant. There's some mistake has been made. And the flight attendant would check the tickets and it had been overbooked that seat. Of all the seats on the airplane, the first <laughs> time for me to ever fly first class, somebody was in my seat. And I said, well, is there another seat? She says, let me check. And I'm still very proud. And of course, they'll give me the seat. Then she said, no, we only have one seat left on the plane. And it was in the middle of the smoking section. That's how long ago it was. And I wasn't a smoker, you know, smokers. Oh, keep your own smoke. So, <laughs> so, all right. I was so angry. I never felt this part of me. It's like this demon came out, you know. I had some thoughts I don't even want to repeat. Uh, it was, how dare you? You know how much money I make, you know. Th but this is the idea of when we feel like I deserve more than all these experiences of childhood where we didn't get what we really deserved. It comes up, the anger, for some people, the sadness, some people, the depression, some people, the anxiety. So, you know, we often think getting what we want is going to make us so happy. And it does for a little while. It's like we have this trash can of stuffed feelings. It just opens up and just starts springing out. And it doesn't come out at once. It comes out in waves. And that's what happens in marriage. Because the idea of marriage is finally I met someone who I feel I can relax, that I can be with, who sees my strengths, who thinks I'm wonderful. My wife thinks I'm handsome. I think she's beautiful. You know, we have, we have this beautiful experience, not demanding perfection. And maybe I'll throw that in as another, a little tip here is when you have self-awareness, you realize you're not perfect. So you can't demand perfection of somebody else. So I think that's where we really resonate is not not not, not demanding perfection, but learning how to enjoy life. We're, we're here to enjoy each other. Absolutely. And, you know, one thing you brought up, too, there's so many things that you just talked about that are so great. And <clears throat> one is, as you say, that you get what you want and you think, yeah, once I get that, I'm going to be happy. And the interesting thing for me in watching groups of intent intenders who join my classes, you know, particularly my year long class, the Power Bait Intention Master Class, they come and oftentimes their intention is, I want to be rich. But when we drill down, they don't really want to be rich. You know, when I really say, you know, you've got to be really specific about what you want, they don't want to be rich in the sense of lots of stuff or money. What they want is, any job but this, or more free time, or more, or, or a new job that is really their passion, or more time for their children or grandchild, or more time to pursue their hobbies. Not necessarily they want to be rich. But as you said, when we get what we want, there's a new list of wants. And oftentimes those bubble up from our past, as you say, one of the things that I do with my husband, Brian Hubbard, who you know well, is we we work on healing people's past because what we find is, as you say, that is an energy. It's an intentional energy that almost sits on their shoulder like an unwanted guest. And that becomes the driver in so many areas. And when you remove 
the survival issue, which is what, you know, oftentimes money is, um, when you remove that, then that, as you say, starts bubbling up to the surface. But here's the other thing I wanted to point out and something very interesting that we see with intention and intention groups. I was reminded of all of this when I found some amazing research. It was a study of two groups of people. One group were the people who had all the money in the world. They had, you know, all the holidays they could possibly take the finest food, all of that stuff. And the researchers thought they would have amazing immune systems because of this. They seemed fulfilled. However, they had terrible immune systems. These were people who were going to be dropping like flies. They were perfect candidates for arthritis, Alzheimer's, heart attacks, the whole gambit. Then they looked at another group who weren't as affluent, but were living a life of service. And these people didn't have as much money, didn't have as many holidays, but their immune systems were incredibly robust. These guys were going to live forever. So one of the things that you were touching on that I thought of when you talked about is the whole sense of altruism, of I want for you what you want for you. And that's what you're talking about a lot of times in, in that sense of listening, giving women a space where they can be heard and they can allow themselves to have their emotions because that's certainly being a woman, that's certainly something that I can remember through all of my life, not necessarily in my marriage. I'm very much listened to in my marriage and more so. But I remember being a young journalist, a young reporter, and I could always get the story because None of the men that I was interviewing ever took me seriously. So they would tell me all kinds of secrets about themselves <laughs> and their work, et cetera. And they thought that tape recorder I had was a toy because they just didn't take me seriously. So I, I totally resonate with that. And I can see where with so many women, they just don't get heard. Tell me a little bit about, tell me about how you resolved and how you recommend that people resolve real conflicts in a marriage or conflicts in a relationship of any sort? Well, I, I will stick to the intimate relationship. The rules are different. You know, when you look at quantum physics, the rules are different at the quantum level than at the surface level. Uh, you know, if you look at politics, it's all about diplomacy, which is lying. <laughs> but with your partner, you have a different kind of diplomacy where you can reveal the parts of you that you really can't show anybody else in the world. You know, if, if, if you feel today, like I'm a complete failure and I came on the show and said, Lynn, I feel like a complete failure. People go, this guy's a basket case. Cause I don't feel like a complete failure. I feel very successful, but I have waves, you know, there'll be these moments when I go very deep, you know, and like you, I'm, I'm a big meditator. And when you go, you know, I go to my, you know, what is it? The, uh, the, three chakras above my head. And then I pull it all the way down the three chakras below, below my body and the depth of my unconscious comes up and it just feels just recently, I'm just sharing a recent experience, but it always, there's always waves, but you know, this time it was, I'm a complete failure. And what I know that has nothing to do with now. See that mm -hmm. has to do when I'm a little boy and I didn't do good on a test. See, it's not about now. If people can understand that now is always wonderful. Anytime now is not wonderful, you're in the past. You're in the past. So if you just go to the past, you can deal with the past and then it's not happening now. And that's called looking at when you're triggered. And when you're triggered, you get upset. And that's what conflict is. And it's a quantum level, this deep unconscious level that comes up in relationships. So that's why we say I have a different set of rules. So now we're in relationship. What happens is, you know, with my, my current wife, I remember when she, oh, we will go back to Bonnie. Most of my stories are all about Bonnie, of course, but my current wife didn't understand relationships so much as, as much as I do, it seems. And she says, you know, everything started to change after a few years. And I said, you get your, you know, you get triggered in the relationship. Why is that? And I said, because we're closer. And when you get closer, you have no defenses. You've opened up. You know, once you start having sex with somebody and you open your heart to them, 
no defenses at all. If they judge you, you're going to be judging yourself. It's like their mind becomes your mind. There's a, a mesh there. You, it, it, you can try to hide it, but if you're connecting sexually, and that's why a lot of couples stop connecting sexually. It's just, it's too much to let somebody affect you that way. But the dynamic here is when you have uh, manage your emotions effectively, then you feel safe in the relationship. Then you can allow your partner to not make you feel good, but make you feel great. I have to make myself feel good. I'm doing this interview with you and sharing with people. I feel wonderful, okay? But when I, that's how much I can do on my own. But when I'm connecting with my partner in a very loving way, I go from good to great, okay? There's no question about it. That That's what I say for people who are not struggling for survival, but you've got beyond survival, your emotions, your needs change. And what we need is a kind of affirmation of the goodness inside of us. When we're, we're in a role mate relationship, a woman needs a man to provide money for her while she's pregnant, raising children. That was the world we left behind. But now women don't need men so much for that. So what do they need men for? What they need men for is a new kind of emotional support, which is the popularity of my books. And you know some of the ideas can be summed up with just hearing your partner, validating your partner, and not doing it from the point of view of seeking to under to say, okay, let's say she's overreacting or being temporarily irrational. Oh, I completely agree with that. No, I understand there's pain inside there. I understand there's hurt inside there. Tell me about it. And what's so interesting, which is men don't real most men don't realize this, if she can talk about what she's feeling, if it's pain, and I can connect with it, understand where she's coming from, her pain goes away. That's called healing. If you can feel what somebody else feels, you help to heal them. And when somebody if, hears what I'm, my pain inside, then I'm healed. And it's not that men don't need to be heard. It's just women need it a lot more. Uh, that, <laughs> that's, the, that's the dynamic. And when people say, well, how can you say that? Let me just explain why I think men and women are different. I've observed these differences. I've written books on it. Many people relate to it. Many people don't relate to it. And so they go, how can you say that? Not everybody's the same. Well, there's certain things that are the, that are biologically the same in me, all men and certain things that are biologically the same in all women. And for women, you, you look at, and this is simple, you can go online, this is very simple science. When a woman's experiencing a stress response, whatever her state of mind is at that time, it's a state of mind that's also producing estrogen. And after ovulation, it's a state of mind that's producing progesterone and estrogen. So it behooves us to understand relationship skills so that when my wife is a little stressed about me or her life or whatever, what, what can I do to support her having that state of mind that will generate the on a biological level, the hormones of stress-free biology? Because mind body, we're connected together. So it turns out that when you listen to a woman talk about her feelings and she feels safe to express what's going on inside that she wouldn't feel safe to express in, to the, in the work world. When she feels safe, so much oxytocin gets produced and she starts to share what's going on inside of her. And it can be at different levels of vulnerability. Estrogen levels will go up. And when women's estrogen levels are about 10 times higher than a man's estrogen levels, averages, she's stress-free. And when her estrogen level starts to double, she's not just stress-free, she's romantically connected and, and open to being intimate. Okay, so there's a, there's a whole biological experience for women that's different from men. Men are like, oh, opportunity, uh, testosterone goes up. Men need to make 10 times testosterone. Some men need to make 20 times more testosterone than a woman makes. Women mm. make a lot of testosterone. No yeah, fun. particularly women, you know, post-menopause. We should yes, yes. also talk about a little bit about what uh, what happens hormonally post-menopause. Well, we'll look at that. But first, have, let's get the basis here of, of sure. the way these hormones work in the body. Uh, for a man, for him to make... For me, 10 times more, I'm stress-free. When my testosterone goes down, any man, when, his test when he's depressed or he's feeling anxiousness, his testosterone will always be down. A violent man has low testosterone in that moment. This is what people don't understand. They think all aggression in men and bad behavior in men is high testosterone. No, it's 
low te his testosterone is going down. See, testosterone goes up like right now. I, I, I anticipate you liking what I have to say. I anticipate that I'm helping other people understand themselves and the relationships better. I anticipate success. That would be my service. When I anticipate success in my service, my testosterone goes up. The symptom of that is confidence. When a man has confidence, it's, he never gets angry. You can't be angry when you're feeling confident. So when you're feeling not confident, see, you know, when the beginning of an argument with a, with a woman, usually a man is like very confident. Oh, I have the answer. I'm right. And he feels good. I, I'm going to win this. <laughs> I'm going to be right. And then she goes, yes, but that's all it takes is a yes, but and a yes, but and he's not right anymore. You know, it's just, <laughs> he's not aware that he's losing confidence. He's like treading water and drowning now as he gets angry. When uh, anger uh, in men, all emotions in men and women, emotions is the surging of estrogen. Estrogen's going up. Remember, women need 10 times more estrogen just to be stress free. So when when she expresses emotion, when she can feel emotion, positive or negative, it's just what you're feeling. It's not, it's not faking it. It's like, what's going on inside of me? What is it? I, I, am I sad? Am I afraid? Am I angry? Am I frustrated, embarrassed, shame? Whatever it is, or am I happy? Am I joyful? Emotions is estrogen. So when a man starts getting emotional and losing confidence, he's angry or he's depressed. So depressed men have low testosterone and high estrogen. Depressed women, actually not so much depressed in the beginning, but overwhelmed women. Uh, women become overwhelmed. The first thing of being overwhelmed is her testosterone, which is, look, I have to solve this, I have to solve this, I have to solve this, and I can't. Uh, I don't have time. The whole feeling of I don't have enough money, I don't have enough time, I don't have enough support, I don't have enough love. It's an ongoing, I don't have enough particularly that's a symptom for women of high testosterone, low estrogen. Now, what? why high testosterone? It's that feeling that I have to do it myself. See, mm -hmm. women have the wisdom. I gained the wisdom as I got older, the wisdom of relationship. You know, they always tell the story of the man who's dying and says, I wish I spent more time on my relationship. Okay, so I had wisdom. Okay, relationship is everything. And that's where the fulfillment of life comes. And think about how we're intended to be. We're intended to have children and prosper. You know, not that everybody has to do that, but we have a civilization. If the civilization isn't making babies, the civilization is dying, which by the way is the case right now. But the we can bring it back. That's my goal is to bring back civilization where couples are making babies, happy families. Women can trust men again. Men can love women again. And, uh, you know, this is a world we're trying to create. And in the process of that, we also become healthier and we live longer. This is a dynamic that where we align so much in terms of what doctors don't know is there's so many good things we can do for our health. And, and even, even when it comes to these relationship skills, you know, I have to be humble here. It's not enough just to know all this. You also have to have the right nutrition in your body. You can have the architect's plan for the house. You can have, but you need to have the builders to put it together. You need to have the wood and the concrete and the wiring and the copper. You, you have to have all the ingredients to build it up, mind and body. And then you have to have spirit, okay? And one of the first steps of spirit, not, I can say this, maybe not everybody has this experience, but we have these different bodies and one of them is the etheric body. It's the first, when you learn to meditate, you begin to feel the space around you, the auric field. The etheric body actually has your genetic blueprint. Now that it comes down into the, crystallizes into the physical body, into our physical DNA. And right now, I, I, you know, I would just feel so depressed and so unhappy temporarily, I always process it, but about all the people who have been invaded, their DNA has now been adjusted. And this is not a good thing uh, with the DNA shots whether people agree with it or not, I do. And so you're, you're changing people's DNA and that's not a good thing. However, the DNA, every three months, if we have the genome, every three months it changes. It corrects all its errors. If you have connection with love, your etheric field, certainly if you're feeling love in your life, you're feeling happy in your life, joyful. 
joyful. What an amazing experience. Joyful, happy, love, being proud, self-esteem. All of these aspects put into action and in service to others, helping others, you know, just helping, feeling like you're helping, you're helping your partner, you're helping your children, you're helping the world. And you're also getting help yourself. That's another big issue here is you have to also know that we need help. So mind, body, spirit, and the spirit part of it is this, this field around us that holds the genetic imprint. We just want to help our body, our genome, to correct the errors. And the body can do that. The body is the intelligent. I mean, what created this body, this massive intelligence? And so there's hope here. And what I feel that helps the hope is particularly another, besides someone putting genes in your body, there's also our behaviors. When a woman is behaving like a man for three months, her genome is now, the gene expression is gonna be more testosterone and less estrogen. See, we're married folks, you know, we have something to come home to. When you're a woman and you, you anticipate coming home and being loved by someone, you feel like I'm not alone in life. But think of all the women who are alone. What happens is they're making the gene expression will be testosterone, which is testosterone is I have to do it myself. I have to do it myself. Estrogen is we do it together. I have help. I want to help and we can help nurturing others, being nurtured, being supported. So mm -hmm. it's not that I don't need nurturing and all that. It's just that before I can actually give nurturing and be selfless, I first have to take care of myself. I need to be confident that I can make myself happy. That's the testosterone thing. Then I go over to my female side. And ironically, that's the urge in men to have sex is to go to their female side. That's, <laughs> you know, a woman spreads her legs. She's saying, okay, I'm, I'm here for you. That's love. You know, she feels vulnerable. She feels open. Then I can connect with my female side, but I also am there to be of service to her. So I'm in my male side while I'm connecting my female side. Well, today we have such a gender fluidity. Men want to have their female side. They want to have their male side. But if they can't get inside over there, then they become feminine. And that is a source of major stress for men. If they're making estrogen more than their testosterone, then they're out of balance. And for women, when they're making testosterone, we can say it simply when they're more on their male side and they're not enough on their female side, they're unhappy. And people can say, well, how do you know if you're on the male side, female side? What is this? Just look, if you're unhappy, anytime mm -hmm. you're unhappy, you're stressed. Anytime you're stressed, we always know when a woman's body is making stress hormones, she's making more testosterone and less estrogen. And all she has to do, and this is a test, go talk to a coach, talk to a therapist, talk to somebody who actually can feel what you're feeling and you'll feel better. I've watched this my whole life as a counselor. Women come in unhappy. I get them to feel safe, talk about what's going on, go deeper into their past, which you also do, help to heal the past. And they, they cry and they feel great. They feel wonderful. And that lasts for a while. <laughs> and they come back in and, and I, I want to teach them how to do it for themselves. And men have a female side too. They can process their feelings. They can learn to do it. But for men, it, life is more about being successful and serving others. And then he goes to his female side. And if a man can be successful in providing for a woman what she actually needs to open up and feel safe and you know feel safe, open her heart, then she wants to connect with him. And that's biologically true. When a woman's estrogen levels are 20 times higher than a man's, she wants to have sex with him. That's what that's why we have to do foreplay, is foreplay <laughs> helps to open up her body or first with the oxytocin that allows her to relax. And then she starts to feel she likes what he's doing. She can now depend on it to feel better and better and better and better. And now her estrogen levels will go higher and higher. It, it's, you know, you know, my daughter, Lauren, you know, we created a wonderful course together. We spent a year and a half battling and discussion. <laughs> and and uh, one of the things she was writing about, she says, you know, when my husband gets enough cave time, when he gets enough cave time, and uh, then whatever he does feels romantic to me. When he comes out of his cave and he does his things, it feels <laughs> romantic. And I say, I'm not going, every time I come out of the cave, I'm not so romantic every time. And I said, so what does it mean to you when he's being romantic? She says, oh, he just feels good. He's happy to empty the trash. He's happy to do the dishes. You know, that's so romantic. 
And I realized, wow, it's like she's when she is in balance. Okay, when she's in balance, then empty when he empties the trash, she's got pink glasses on. She's got another set of glasses, you know. So, <laughs> so, a woman's, That's so interesting. If, so the point, and then I'll, I'll stop that one. But if a woman's stressed, he could be emptying the trash, and her reaction is, "Well, I I made dinner," you know. It's just a transactional, not intimate thing. But if she's not feeling stressed and he happily is doing the dishes, she feels that's so romantic and she gets so turned on. You see, it's all where you're coming from. If you're at a low level, men can do anything. And so what? He should do that. I do this for him. When she's here, he does little things, which is one of the good ideas. It's still true in Men Are From Mars. What men have to know is little things make a big difference for women, whether it's big or little, lots of affection, lots of understanding, lots of hugs. And these are all dynamics because we know women need more oxytocin, they need more estrogen, and they need more progesterone after they're having their uh, ovulation time. They need more progesterone. So would it be good to know what makes progesterone? Well, social bonding makes progesterone. Being with people you like being with, not that you have to do something for them. They're not children. Children produces estrogen. But if, if you feel supported, progesterone is social bonding with people you like and you enjoy. It's a give and take. It's like an equal give and take. And But there's no requirement. Or yeah. it's a give and take to yourself. Go take a hot bath. Put some bubbles in it. You know, Go for a walk in nature. Enjoy yourself in the garden. So these kinds of behaviors where you're at ease and doing what you like to do makes progesterone. And after ovulation, see, women are way more complicated than men. Women are chocolate, men are vanilla. Men just need up and down testosterone. Women have a whole cycle and, <laughs> and the progesterone is so important. Whenever women are suicidal, whenever women are extremely depressed, when women are massively irrational, overreacting, it's generally five days during the five days before their period. Because, and we know that by the, just how much suicide that happens in women at that time or thoughts of suicide. And it's always associated with, associated with low progesterone and high estrogen compared to the progesterone. Women mm -hmm. always need estrogen, but they need to have, towards ovulation, estrogen has to go really high. Then after ovulation, they still need to have relationship, but they also need higher levels of progesterone. So you need to have a lifestyle where you're doing what you like to do and you enjoy doing. And in all those situations, <clears throat> ideally, it's stress-free. When it's stress for women, then their testosterone goes up. That Because you know stress means I feel threatened. I have to do it myself. So this is a, a little primer on that. And Absolutely. And a brilliant one. And what you're really saying too, John, is you know, what we have to do is pay attention to a lot of this relationship is also biology. And we have to understand that more in order to get along with people. Now, I wanted to say you said so many great things. And I want to talk a bit about, you said, first of all, just the biology of things, progesterone going up. Well, first of all, I want to say that a lot of my audience is probably postmenopausal. And there are a lot of people who follow me and will be on this call who don't have a partner. So I want to address a few things that you talked about. You talked about being in a social situation that makes you feel safe. One of the things that I have found that works so well for relationships are small groups, small intentional groups, power of eight groups, as I call them. Yes, and they're fantastic. And the people getting together, and of course, you've got a men's group. There's also a women's group I know, a corresponding women's group of our, our fellow friends in, in uh, Northern California who meet every week. And I've got at least two sets of them that I meet with every week. And these essentially become like your intention family. They yes. become a place where you can be yourself. So if you are not necessarily in a relationship, I mean, I think of Jerry. Jerry was part of my master class during lockdown. And by the end of it, he joined again. For, so this is a whole year long course where we put people into groups and we find groups in their time zone. We put them into groups. They meet virtually for a year at, during my teaching, et cetera. And there was Jerry at the end of the year, he joined again 
And I said, why, Jerry, you just had this course. He said, I wanted more. I have felt more compassion, more love and caring from this group than I've ever had in my life. And I wanted more. And by the end of the second year, he said, I now know what love is coming through the airwaves. So for many people, and I also get a lot of people joining my groups who want to find love. So I want to address that a bit too. But just first, this whole idea of using a group, healing with a group, regularizing yourself with a group can also lead to relationships. I think of Joy. Joy joined a Power of Eight group. She joined this master class of mine and she wanted to find love. And I love this story. You'll love this too, John. So her group does intentions for her to find love. Well, within a week or two, she gets a call from a boyfriend of hers of 35 years ago, 35 years ago. And he's in London, he's in Britain and she's in Australia by now. And they start talking, they start corresponding and they start phoning and he decides to make the leap. So he comes to Australia, goes through quarantine for two weeks, moves in with her, they're together, they're in love, etc. So it's, I love the idea of intention, finding love, helping to find love, and also that groups providing support. And I think that's one of the other powerful things about intention. You also learn to be not only vulnerable in this group, learn to deal with your past. And as I said, that's something we try to heal because the past can be an energy that informs the present, just as you said. So I remember with my husband, Brian, he had a terrible childhood. He had the most grotesque dad. He didn't even call him by name for the first seven years of his life. He just whistled for him. He was, and he stopped him at every turn. Brian is a total autodidact. He taught himself, he went to a terrible school. Most of the people in that school are probably in jail now. And he, you know, he taught himself, he put himself through university as an adult, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But I recognized early in our marriage when he would get angry and upset, I started realizing a long time ago that he wouldn't, he wasn't talking to me. He was talking to his father. And so my, my, a real healing element for me and a connection for me was understanding that and just walking away, giving him the space to deal with this surge of energy, this unwanted guest that had temporarily invaded him. And he learned with time and his own work called Time Light to, to get rid of that unwanted guest and to forgive his father, which is quite amazing. And that's what he teaches. So there's a lot of elements of what you talked about. But one of those things that, as I say, tends let me, to- Let me pause for a moment, because you, you sure. answered the question you asked me, which is how do you, once you have conflict, I was talking about building up the conflict, your hormones are out of balance. As soon as it starts to escalate, which is you're describing he's getting upset in a nice way, walk away. That's called time out. We have to learn how in a nice way to stop conversations before they escalate. And then you go and you do the business you need in order to come back to having your heart open. That's the answer. I mean, you just are not allowed to raise your voice, get upset with your partner, say mean things to your partner, complain too much about your partner. As soon as you start doing that, well, you did this and you did that. You go, oh, we're escalating. Time out. And we think I have to be, I have to get you to think I'm right. And then we'll be at ease. No, I don't have to you change at all. I can come back to being at ease. And we have so many strategies to do that. I mean, there are any good personal growth strategy is learning how to come back to feeling at ease and comfortable. Uh, for me, I've had the advantage of meditation. Then I had the advantage of psychology to understand that my stuff is my stuff. My reactions are my reactions. I have to get back to love. And I use a lot of emotional processing techniques and looking at my childhood and dealing with that, coming back in present time and now being able to go without telling my partner what they did wrong, come and do the right thing, which is to be supportive of them in some nice way. And that's what you just described an experience of how to do that. 
You know, and one other thing that people never think about when they're disagreeing. So we'll talk about relationships disagreeing in any way. So this could be your partner or this could be your boss, or it could be your neighbor or whatever. There is that sense of I'm right, they're wrong. And particularly when it isn't an intimate relationship, the uh, ability to really understand why somebody is reacting the way they are is really diminished. One of the things that has really worked for me and that I teach is sending positive intention to that person who you disagree with completely who disagrees with everything you stand for. And of course, that's so uh, you know common these days with these polarized points of view. Send that person positive intention. And what ends up happening, I guarantee it, is them and their reaction to you. They will, that energy changes between you. You know, we talked, you talked a little bit about, you know, quantum effects and the the fact that we are energy and we are at our most fundamental nethermost level, we are just vibrating packets of energy and our thoughts are just one other kind of energy that trespasses beyond us into other people and things. And, you know, I've demonstrated that for many years with my intention experiments, um, 41 to date and 37 have shown measurable positive mostly significant effects. But one of the things that has been remarkable to me is just seeing what happens when you do change that energy. And one of the things that can help a great deal is sending positive intention, no matter what. I'll give you, know, you, there, you know, people hear about multi-dimensional, we're multi-dimensional beings. And somebody said this to me and it made it so concrete. They said, you know, this is a three-dimensional world. You know, I can hold these supplements. I can hold my mouse. I can touch the computer. I can see you. But can you see a thought? <laughs> it's another dimension. Our thoughts are another dimension. It's beyond time and space. Yeah, this is this is a reality. Your thoughts are so powerful if you can sustain them. And of course, we can't always sustain positive thoughts, positive feelings. But we train ourselves to come back to the positive, come back to the positive. In, in a sense, it's the same thing how I've grown in monogamy and marriage. Uh, there's just, a part of me just can't even think about not being monogamous. It would just be so weird because it's like meditation. Meditation, your mind wanders, you bring it back, you bring it back. Well, when your mind as a younger man, it will wander. Oh, check that out. Bring it back. I'm happily married. Bring it back. Bring it back. So you're training yourself once again to be in love. It takes monogamy is a very important concept about this. I see some comments, people saying, well, what if you're bisexual, whatever? What if you're gay? What, you know, these are all variations. What I'm talking about is if you want to find happiness, make sure if you're a woman, for example, that if you're stressed, that you have someone who can support you in coming back to your female side. And often many women are bisexual just because they don't trust men. I won't say all are, but basically they don't, they don't have a man. They never saw a father who could support mother. And many men don't get involved with women because they never saw a mother appreciating a man, a man being successful and providing for her. We just don't have these role models and they're disappearing more and more. So people are going, well, gee, it seems like married people are unhappy. No, so many married people are happy. I counsel people all the time. I still counsel, I teach workshops. They're very happy. And it, you know they can have problems and some people are have bigger problems, all right? And but. We don't have a society now that can guide men and women to a new way of having a relationship, which is not based upon the role mate. The role mate is where you have a particular role and you stick to it. And a woman has a role, she sticks to it. There's traditional roles. And there's nothing wrong with that if you choose that, if that feels right for you. But there's another level of transition we're going through where when you don't depend on each other for, and what's a relationship? Interdependence, right? So if you don't, if a woman doesn't depend on a man for money, put it in a gross way, then what does she need a man for? So it has to be an awakening that what I need a man for is to get a new kind of emotional support, which you're describing in the group of eight. When you have your group of eight, you're feeling love. You know, someone for the first time, this is what love feels like. They didn't have a family where they felt loved. I was just talking to my neighbor, who's also a very successful man and a doctor and so forth. 
And we're talking about our mothers. <laughs> At the end of our conversation, we're like, thank God we had our mothers because our mothers loved us so much. And, you know, just for a boy to feel he's good enough. And our fathers were successful in helping our mothers to feel good enough. It was just not everybody gets that. And so this feeling of family is so important. And you're providing that uh, connected intention, selflessness and service through that. So powerful. And then there's another dimension of life, which is intimate relationship between men and women. That's what's going to keep civilization going. And for people who have that, let's find a way for them to be fulfilled in that process of marriage. And it's really, we don't, we don't know this new way where uh, women understand that men are different. Even though I have a female side, I'm very different in that many, many ways and see those differences in a positive way. A simple example of that is if I'm stressed, I just don't want to relate and connect and have a conversation with my wife. I, I need my time to distract myself and forget the problems of my day. Now, some modern people might say, well, that's denial. I said, no, no, that's not denial. That's forgetting the problems of your day. Women, you just don't have the ability to easily forget the problems of your day. You should be talking about the problems of your day as a way to build up estrogen. For men, we need to forget the problems of the day. And the men who disagree with me, I go, okay, if you're if you're not, if your wife is happy with you talking about your problems, fine. But what I hear from women all the time is men talk too much now. It used to be men didn't talk at all. Now it's men, men are complaining and they're getting upset and they're, you know, <laughs> I don't want to hear that. She's like, I don't want to hear that. And it seems cruel, but actually men have to learn how not to depend on a woman to process their negative feelings to a great extent. There's sometimes big problems, you know, you, you need some empathy and compassion, but men have to be more self-sufficient, self-reliant. Why? Because self-reliance produces testosterone. When testosterone goes up, his stress levels go down and the problem's not there anymore. So what men do is they just mull it over and they think about it. They can watch a football game. They can play a video game. That's going to his cave. Now, when he goes to his cave, if a woman doesn't understand that's a normal thing for men, then she takes it personally. He doesn't love me or he must be mad at me or why does he want to spend time with me? No, people have that need. And, and women today, as they're more... Uh, gender fluid, they recognize they need that time as well. And particularly if you've got a guy who's gender fluid way on his female side, you really want to go to your cave. So we're, we're all confused about this. But the, the, the reality is you come back to hormones. We have this biology that's evolved over millions of years. And for men, the hormones that allow him to make a baby are the hormones of well-being for him. And the hormones allow a woman to make a baby produce well-being for her, then she establishes until she gets to menopause, which women, of course, there's women listening to that. The hormones aren't going to control you so much, but you and your attitude and your, and your behaviors ideally have been established, which would have normally made those hormones. And women don't have to make as much estrogen. And let's just talk about sex for a moment you know, the to have orgasm requires your estrogen levels to double. Uh, that's the whole thing to make a baby. Your estrogen levels double. Your body produces more testosterone at that time. So you want to have sex. There's desire. Now, when estrogen, as you go through menopause, you're not going to make as much estrogen. But I have many women who are having wonderful sex with their partners and they're, they're in their late 70s, the highest, 78. And, and what is it is... It's not a matter of how much estrogen, it's the balance between her estrogen and her testosterone. You know, there's a, a place for many women kind of, if they're jaded in life and they get older, well, men won't do anything. I have to do everything myself. It's easier, easier to do it myself than depend on anybody else. Why bother to ask for help? I'll just do it myself. You, you know, that's a toughening. That's a toughening. And it inhibits the estrogen production. It's the imbalance of the hormones that's most important. And we're talking about balance, whether it be at menopause or at any time. As I mentioned, three months of a woman being on her male side, her genome is going to start expressing automatically more testosterone and less estrogen. And people always ask me, what do I recommend? Because we're all into supplements. And my favorite one is something I produced for this, which is, I think you've heard me talk about it before, but it's, it's three very important orotates lithium orotate, calcium orotate, and magnesium orotate. Calcium orotate, orotate is a substance in mother's milk that bonds with minerals and it delivers it into the brain. 
And what you need for the brain to be in balance, to produce the male and female side in balance is dopamine, which is more of our male side and ester and serotonin, which is more of our female side. Magnesium orotate tends to increase the serotonin. In my experience of working with people, calcium tends to produce more dopamine, but you got to have them balanced. And that's the magic one. It's gender balance, gender balance, hormone balance. It's lithium, lithium orotate. Now, unfortunately, I see many people from around the world, you can't buy it. You can only buy it in America. It's not illegal anywhere else. It's not illegal, but you can't buy it in England. You can't, maybe in Germany, you can buy it. Not sure. Australia, you can't buy it. This is the pharmaceutical in industry keeps you from taking this very inexpensive, powerful mineral. What I found, you put that in a blend. And, and I've been promoting this for 25 years because it's helped me so much balance myself. And not that I don't take other supplements as well. So I thought I would put all my best supplements and those three orotates in one product, which you can learn about at marsvenus.com. All the other supplements are things that we know, like uh, ashwagandha to help relax, rhodiola rosea, proven to increase your dopamine levels, bacopa, cognitive function, memory, uh, saffron, good for taking away food cravings. I just put the whole, <laughs> all the good stuff in there along with some good fulvic minerals. Uh, and, and it has an amazing effect for people if they're also doing the behaviors. So here you are, a menopausal woman. What you need is to still feel that I can open up and share the vulnerable feelings from my childhood. Okay, they need to be able to come up. As we get older, we become younger. If you notice old people who don't know how to process their feelings, they're now like helpless and dependent on other people. They literally become a baby. Okay, that's what aging is for people. They're incompetent and can't think right, depending on others. Or you can still be healthy and vibrant like we are, but be aware of the baby inside because with all the wisdom of age, our childhood's issues will come up and we have to learn how to process those things. Being in a group, like you do, it helps to feel the love. For those who are fortunate to have a marriage, they can also, that doesn't replace the need for being in a group. I want to emphasize that. We as human beings need to belong. It's a belonging kind of love. We need independence, self-sufficiency, which is our personal growth. We need intimacy. And, and we can find that by sharing vulnerability with some people we love and like. And then we have also service to the world, also, we have nurturing to children or people who are dependent on us and then serving God. These are all like different needs a human being has. And, you know, if I was having problems, another thing I would do to come back to my balanced place is I look at these different needs. And if I'm not getting what I need in my marriage, that's intimacy with someone, interdependence. If I'm not getting what I need in that, I shift to another love tank, so to speak. I go back to what... Well, let me go fill up another tank, which is love myself. Do something that I enjoy doing that's good for me. Or I go back to my teenage self and let me go be with my other guys and do stuff with guys. Girls would do stuff with other girls. Or we'd be in a, a classroom and learning things together. Uh, or I go back to playing games. That's childhood, playfulness and fun. Uh, these are needs that we have as human beings and we sort of evolve through them. And that first seven years of our life, that very infant side is where we are dependent on someone else. That's for having a good coach. That's for having a therapist. That's for having a teacher, someone who's wiser than you, that you can depend on them for some kind of excellence. Reading books is very important for that. Uh, having wisdom, someone who knows more than you is fulfilling a certain need we have as well. Also right livelihood. All of these kinds of things are very important. And if you just focus on one thing, it's like think of my need for, uh, relationship, it's a tank and it fills up as it's filling up. It's like if you're hungry and you're filling up with food, it feels so good. But when you're full, eating more food doesn't make you feel good. Mm -hmm. Then you have to realize there's other needs I have besides the hunger for food. So we have to recognize we're multidimensional beings. We have all these different needs. And it's not as simple as just expecting everything from one person. It's not as simple as expecting everything from myself. That These are stages of life. We need to have a, a bigger picture. One of the things we haven't talked about before we take some questions, John, and I know we I've got some in our q and A I want to address. One of the things we haven't talked about is, you know, that great Joni Mitchell line, uh, love is touching souls. 
So we've talked a lot about the body and intimacy and physical in intimacy. What was the thing that touched souls for you in your 34 year marriage? And I'll see if I can answer mine. Well, this, you know, it, it's, I have to say this in the right context, but it's making love. Uh, making love regenerates every cell of my body. Uh, I know how to do it. I've been trained. <laughs> to, not everybody has the training to go to the heights of ecstasy, uh, but that's for my soul. The, the, I remember the time, it just became so clear to me while making love to my wife, which is, I'm yours, you're mine, we are one. And you know, yes. people go, oh, you can't control somebody. There's no controlling there. It's, I'm your husband, you could put it that way. You're my wife, we are one. But the feeling is, I'm yours, you're mine, and we're one. Yes. She is, she became my female side. And by nurturing her female side, my own female side, my own feminine neediness was fulfilled. Uh, that was a oneness that we experienced. And so that was, and you have that moment, then you have a moment of her giving birth to our baby, <laughs> you know, the, the other moments, of course. But uh, yes. that's something that we could renew every week, every week, just renewing that beautiful, beautiful- yes experience. Yes. And you know, what I think is really interesting about this, and I'm going to broaden the whole concept of touching souls. I mean, I guess I met my husband and I knew probably within a week of meeting him that this was my soulmate. And this was inconvenient because we were both married to other people at the time. My I was newly separated. He was miserable. And we, you know, we ended up getting together eventually. And um, it was a soulmate situation. And so I'm going to just, just bring that to maybe an ultimate thing of all of these things feed that, but somehow it is recognizing, one thing you said is so interesting, recognizing yourself in the other. And something else you talked about, about how we're all complex mixes of male and female. And this will speak to the people in the audience who may be bisexual, the people in the audience who are gay, the people in the audience who don't have a partner now is, yeah, we have uh, all of these things. And I have seen that in this 33 year old marriage of mine. And I should say, Brian and I live together and work together. So we're with each other pretty much all the time. And we're sharing things all the time. I guess what is ultimately happened through all of that experience of children and relations and all of that with us is almost a sense of our spirit is entwined. Our, we are just, we are just connected all the time. And so I invite all of you to understand that you can experience this. You can find this. I found that intention is really a powerful way of doing it. If you are wanting to improve relationships, a power of eight group can help because the very process of intending for someone else or something else, that altruistic intention, call it secular prayer, there's something about that that is extraordinarily healing. I've seen it, you know, one of the most powerful situations I ever saw, this is outside of individual relationships, was an intention experiment I ran with both Arabs and Israelis a few years ago. And we had cameras in eight different Arab cities in conference rooms. And the ninth camera was in an audience of an Israeli, Israeli Jews. Now, I had to organize the whole thing because neither side was speaking to the other. But by the time we finished, we did an intention to lower violence in Jerusalem. The Arabs were sending love to the Israelis. The Israelis were saying, your God is my God to the Arabs. And we were seeing the heart leap across the fence. So this is another kind of relationship, but this also works in individual ones too. A moment of altruism, of selfless giving, as you do with an intention experiment, really helps the heart to leap across the fence and really helps you move toward that situation of love touches touching souls. 
So I you, get, I, I just agree a hundred, hundred percent. And when you're in a group of eight, it's so much easier to hold that feeling. That's another thing is that the resonance of everyone doing it holds you in it. And it's just such a beautiful, beautiful experience of connecting with whatever, whoever you're intending to bless or to heal or to support. You know, I get to have that experience as well as a therapist. I have to say uh, every day I send uh, love to all my clients and, uh, you know, I know them inside and I feel them and I heal them. It's such a beautiful, beautiful thing that, you know, having been a healer as well myself, just not that I focus so much on that anymore. I just need people to understand relationship skills and health. But when you're, when you feel a person's pain, you heal it. You feel where they're coming from. You feel their fear. You feel their angst. And you're in a place of blessing. It releases it. And there's nothing more powerful than that. I just feel so blessed that I have a job where I could be healing people all the time. But that's just one way of being of service. That's my soul's journey to be of service. There's so many different ways we can help other people. It's when we're helping, we're outside of ourselves. But you can be helping. You also have to be helped. That's the other thing. And I have to say for the women listening, that's often their biggest challenge. Their biggest challenge is being able to have someone help you. And if no one's helping you, how to ask for help. So many women just don't learn to ask for help, how to ask for help. And so you feel, you have to experience that there's a reciprocity that's going on. And often when there's a, a woman with a man, uh, there's a, when they're together, a woman assumes that if I offer help, he will offer help back. But when, <laughs> it's not always going to work that way with a man. If you ask for help, and he provides it, then you appreciate it. Then in the future, he'll be more willing and motivated to quickly respond in a more powerful, positive way. It, it's like, you know, if I was to fly to China to teach a seminar and they paid me, you know, less than I make in America, I wouldn't go. I, mean, <laughs> I can make that money here. It's this anticipation of the result. If For a man, if the result is bigger, there's more energy to produce it. And so when a woman asks for help, that means she's being vulnerable then that means his reward will be greater. It, it's a simple me mechanism. If somebody doesn't really need me, why should I bother is the way men often think. I think there is such a confusion between the sexes that had started in, you know, probably the 70s with, you know, the first wave of women's liberation where women having felt that they had no seat at the table when it came to work, felt that they had to prove themselves by being ubermen. And I think that possibly started it. And then men got very confused about, well, what is my role here? Uh, and then women were fearful and still fear fearful because, I mean, I remember not only did no, anyone, no one take me seriously as a young journalist, but every man hit on me. Every single man hit on me. So I, you know, had to fend that off. And so you you have to, we were dealing with a whole bunch of things we wanted to change. And I think it's interesting watching this next generation where they're kind of melding into that a lot more seamlessly, but still a bit confused. So I think maybe it's up to us to help restore the good things about the differences between the sexes and help move on from the things that were destructive. And I think now, because we have, we everybody needs to have essentially a, a two income family when they're, when we have to do, when we have families these days, there's no question about it. It's not a, it's not a, just a, a, an engaging thing to, to do as women. You know, we need the money. We don't have a lot of choice now. <laughs> we don't have a lot of choice now. So we have to start redefining things, but understand, as you put it all the time so well, that there are biological things here going on and we have to honor them and understand them and they will help. They will help all the rest of the relationships. I've got a question for you, John, from somebody said, I've always felt insecure in all my rela romantic relationships, always afraid he'll meet someone else who's more interesting or attractive, et cetera. How do I overcome this? Well, 
I, I'd say you're in a camp of a lot of women feel that way. There's no question about it. As men grow older, they tend to grow in power. Women start out with the power of their beauty. All those men are hitting on you. Okay. And then I, I presume there's not as many men hitting on you now. Not that you're not more beautiful and radiant. Okay. <laughs> there's, there's this, the, not super, quite the same amount. <laughs> right, right. It's the superficial aspects of life here. And there is a reality that as you get older, younger women uh, will appeal to a man and pull him away. That this is certain circles of the world, like in China, for example, where I teach, this is a very big problem. Uh, married women just know their husband's going to cheat. You know, it's just, it's a crazy thing. It's, it's very, very sad. And what I found is that if I could just explain to the women is that when you bond with a man with vulnerability, that's what keeps him attracted to you. When a woman is vulnerable, my wife, Bonnie, is more beautiful to me today uh, and even in our last days together than when she was younger. Physically, it's one thing, but emotionally, it's another thing. And a fun story to share with this is that men, men are hormonal beings, okay? W when we're turned on to you, you're the most beautiful being in the world. And you can't imagine this because you're so hypercritical of your body, typically for many women. So I remember the first year of marriage and I took Bonnie to the lingerie shop, you know, young couples <laughs> going to go do the lingerie. <laughs> and there was a right, right. We're going into the lingerie shop. There's a poster of a woman wearing a, a purple, sexy looking bra and panties. All right. And I said, let's get that. <laughs> and Bonnie says, well, that's not my body type. I said, no, no, honey, that's your body. <laughs> she goes, no, that's not my body. I said, no, that's your body. And I was convinced that was her body. And then that last, and then that night, uh, we were, it, it, she was getting undressed. I looked, I said, it's true. That's not her body type. Uh, when men have arousal towards you, you're perfect. You can't imagine how wonderful that is uh, for a man. And what is turning him on is vulnerability. Now, on a surface level, it's when you're revealing to him parts of your body that other, other women aren't revealing. Okay, that means you're special. See, it's, if I'm special and I'm important to you and I make it safe for you, my testosterone goes up. So it's a woman's vulnerability that allows a man to stay attracted to her. It's not because, you know, before I married Bonnie for 34 years, I had another wife for two years. And I was shocked because it wasn't, she wasn't vulnerable. She's a wonderful human being. We're good friends, but she wasn't vulnerable at that time. We'll put it that way. And I was shocked to be in bed with her naked with a beautiful woman. And I'm not turned on to her at all. I said, what happened? It was just physical. Physical will never last. What lasts in a marriage is the, the, the love in her heart, the vulnerability. Now, what is vulnerability? And I, I, this is, I have to share this. It's so good when it comes to the hormone thing. It comes to love because it's just so simple. If you look at love like ice cream, different flavors of ice cream, if you if you're standing in front of an audience and they're applauding you, your testosterone goes up, whether you're a man or a woman. When people are appreciating you, good job, good job, testosterone goes up. And men need, we know, 10 to 20 times more testosterone. So basically, men are always looking at where am I going to get the applause? Where am I going to get the bigger reward? Where am I going to get the bigger reward? It's a major motivator for men because it helps lower his stress, creates well-being. So appreciation, not that women don't need appreciation, but women don't need so much testosterone like a man. So what do women need? What raises estrogen? Respect. When you respect someone, their estrogen goes up. So when I respect the baby crying, I hold, I get up out of bed. I want to sleep. I don't really want to do this, but I'm happy to do it because my baby. So I'm respecting, I'm going beyond myself and service to someone else. So always the greatness of men is doing the dirty jobs, the dangerous jobs, the difficult jobs, the deadly jobs. We're happy to do it. Why? Because we're respecting others. Okay. That's a, a man's fulfillment is when he's in that selfless place, because when he's in that selfless place, he anticipates reward. He anticipates, you know, the soldiers going off to battle, there's parades when they get home. There's women <laughs> oh, turned on to those guys, you know, they know it, you see. So it's the anticipation of success will increase testosterone. The anticipation of getting what you need, being respected to honor your needs, to respect you, that's a big estrogen producer. So what I know as a man, respect a woman, that's going to raise her estrogen. I appreciate her as well, but respecting her is what she needs most. 
Uh, that's just two flavors, appreciation, respect. Understanding, when I take the time to understand where you're coming from, even if you're being overreactive or irrational, and I take the time to understand where you're coming from with empathy and caring, what's gonna happen is estrogen goes up. This is why 90% of the people who go to therapists are women. Men, on the other hand, what men want, what a form of, of love that will uh, raise testosterone is acceptance and forgiveness not demanding him to be more, accepting him just as he is. And when you accept a man as he is, you will get more as opposed to trying to change him, accept him. And that's the Mars Venus ideas. You know, when it's like a cave, women, oh, I just have to, he has his time. And some women would say to me, well, if he's in his cave, what am I supposed to do? You're supposed to have a life. You know, you can't make him everything in your life. You've got other things that make you happy. So there's acceptance, a big form of, of love for a man. When you say to a man, Honey, next time call me. I had dinner, dinner got cold. And it's not such a big deal, but try to remember next time. When you throw that little phrase in, it's not such a big deal. You're giving him acceptance. Some things are huge deals, but most of the stuff we get upset about, not really a big deal. Say that out loud to him. Honey, it's not a big deal, but next time would you do this? Acceptance. The next one, and then people's women say, Well, how long do I have to do accept <laughs> your lifetime? You have to accept who he is. That's what love is. You accept each other. And not that my wife doesn't need my acceptance and I do accept her, but when I understand her better, it's easier for me to accept her. And when women just come from a place of that's the way men are, then you can begin to be more forgiving and accepting, uh, forgiving. And the third form of love real quickly is trust. That's what vulnerability is. When you take your clothes off in the presence of a man, you're trusting he's gonna think you're beautiful. It's a scary thing to do. Now, more scary than that is to share your insecurities, your doubts, whatever. When you reveal that, it's the, it's the vulnerability inside of women is an expression of trust. You're the person I can depend on. And the flip side of that is demonstrations for a woman, what raises estrogen, is men being a gentleman, caring, being considerate, being thoughtful. You know, this it doesn't have to be perfect, but just show that you care. Uh, you know, you're a priority and to help men understand that. I say, you know, men think about, you got a new car and then you come outside and somebody has scratched it, <laughs> cheated. it. You go, Oh, my new car. Well, that's called caring. You know, you really care. You prioritize and that mm. grows over time. So those are three forms of love. Certainly we all need all of it, but as a priority, men need more appreciation, acceptance, and trust. Women need more caring, respect, and understanding. So now I know my go-to place to give her the maximum support. So hopefully that under, that answers our attendees' question about um, about her her man and her worry that he's going to cheat on her. What you're basically saying, which I thought was really good, is fulfilling that need will make you the most beautiful woman in his yes. in his yes. eyes. Absolutely. And I love the idea of, of understanding and respect, which has to be at the heart of it, of everything, because um, most people, you know, the relationship corrodes, I think, because they are picking at each other. And it's, a, it, it's picking little bits off the other person until there is nothing of that relationship left. And the the wonderful thing of it's not such a big deal it's um you know it's okay don't worry about it um i've seen that many times in our relationship too where that's been a really important thing to say because otherwise it is taken as a terrible a terrible criticism and that can be um that can be corrosive and what's so important about that is you've you've made your feelings known, but you've done so in a loving way. In a loving way. You're not like trying to control your partner, punish them, disapprove yes. of them, all that stuff, yes. old fashioned stuff. But I thought of something very funny as you're talking, because here you are with your wisdom, is re recognizing that, you know what, I'm accepting and easygoing with my husband. That's loving, okay? But imagine if I practice this with my wife, I mean, directly practices, let's say she's upset about something. And I say, Oh, honey, it's no big deal. <laughs> you see how that that's not what she needs to hear. But to no. me, if she says to me, Oh, you forgot to turn out the lights, you know, John, it's not a big deal. And sometimes you remember and I love it. And then walk I, out of the room. That's all. 
Uh, I know, so I know. Gonna... That's all. That's all. That's all. I have one other question for you that somebody said. This is quite good. Long distance relationships. Are they possible? How to make it work until deciding to relocate and be together? Any thoughts about that? Yeah, sometimes uh, you start out long distance. It's great because you're you're missing each other so much, but you need to be able to try out your relationship, spending times together. Okay, mm -hmm. don't make any final commitments until you spend some time to be together and see if that works out because it's a little bit of an illusion, uh, but a good illusion and in, in the sense that when when you're not living together, men have their cave time. Okay. <laughs> They're in their cave all the time, so to speak. And then they connect with you on the phone or the internet, whatever. But then when you move in together, he's going to need his cave time still. And you're going to kind of go, why are you ignoring me now? Well, when you were in different places, you were being ignored all the time. So mm -hmm. it's, it's sometimes the best thing is to meet somebody at a distance. That's why you would date. You wouldn't move in right away. You know, the younger generation, they fall in love. Now they're going to move in. Okay, you can do that, but no, it's going to be a challenge because he's no longer going back to his apartment <laughs> where he gets to you know, have a messy room or something. You know, he, he, you're, you're now together. So it does bring new challenges. And I always say, if you can hold off from living together simply because uh, the problems are going to be greater. Learn to build trust when there's not such big challenges. And so now you have this trust that you have little upsets, you get through them, you get little upsets. Now you know oh, how to get through these things instead of being hit with a big, big problem, kind of like with a homeopathic remedy. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. it gives you the, the poison that you're reacting to. You give a little dose of it and you learn your body learns how to deal with it. And then when the when the big poison comes along, your body can deal with it for people who know homeopathy. Absolutely. John, we've reached about the end. I want to just somebody asked me, am I going to run another intention experiment for uh, Israel and for Gaza? And the answer is yes, we'll be doing further ones. We've run three so far, John, 30,000 people. And <clears throat> one of the things about my intention experiments we found, because we've surveyed the participants, is that their lives change. They become more peaceful when they're doing this intention together. And so I did a little calculation. If the, those 30,000 people, and they all seem to be much more loving towards strangers, if they all affect other people, and we know other people get affected by us down a social network, Harvard University stuff shows that. So if all those 30,000 people know 600 other people, I worked out that it, we would there would be an effect on 1 billion people. So this is a little bit like the TM organization's work on meditation and getting the crime rate to go down. Um, but this is one of the things we're seeing is extraordinary rebound effects. So that's one little thing I wanted to put in. But before I leave you, tell everybody the name of that supplement you talked about with lithium orotate. And they can get it on your website? Well, they go to my website and then it will direct them to Amazon where you can get it there. But it's really amazing. I've been promoting What's it. What's it called? What's it, it called? Was, it used to be called Super Minerals for those that used to take them. But it's now called Elemental Orotates. Elemental Orotates. And what I found is it helps produce this gender balance. But it, not, uh, it helps your body hold on to gender balance as you're doing the behaviors and the attitudes that will stimulate for men more testosterone, for women more estrogen. And this change happens in your genome when you're not in a stress state. So then there's all these eight different adaptogens that will lower your stress state. You know, I mentioned a few of them, ashwagandha and rhodiola, saffron and various ones like that. They're all very well known to, to balance dopamine, serotonin production, lower your stress levels, produce testosterone. There's a lot of zinc in there for the men's product. So they get their testosterone as well. So, but what you want to do is uh, use this to support the behavioral changes. That's the whole thing. It's not a drug. A drug causes you to altered state right away. You know, this is going to notice right away if you're doing the kinds of things that would stimulate estrogen and progesterone if you're a woman, things that would produce more testosterone. And for men, when it comes to testosterone, let me just throw this in, Lynn, because the testosterone levels are just crashing for men. I'm, you know, 72 years old and my testosterone levels are 50% higher than when I was a young man. 
and sometimes uh, 100% more. This is, this is not inevitable that men's testosterone levels have to go down, just like we don't have to all die at 56 or 70, whatever it is, is testosterone stays high or healthy for a man. And what I've done is one of the most important things is, uh, I don't want to offend anybody, but when men have sex too much, they're losing their life force. Okay, sex too much. Uh, research has shown even on young men that releasing the semen only once a week causes every week your testosterone stays 50% higher. Okay, if you release the semen, it just goes down every 1% every year, release it. So pornography is one of the worst things that's happening on the planet today. Kids are all addicted to it. It's massively addicted to it. They're losing uh, the semen in the body. It's very, very important for males uh, to not release so much. And, uh, you know, for many of your listeners, I've studied Tantra and Taoist yoga and so forth. So I make love without releasing the semen. That's why I can be so old and not be so old. Uh, the life force <laughs> is there. You know, for men, this is the generation. This is the energy that creates life force uh, in a man's body. So I'm just anything we can do to read books and understand that all this too much sex is not a good thing. No sex is not a good thing, but it's not a bad thing. If you're using your energies in a selfless, loving way, uh, you know, monks can thrive. <clears throat> I was a monk for nine years. I thrived. And now here I am at 72 and I'm still thriving. So it's <laughs> like you have to have sex in life, but you have to have love and love, and from a place of love, feeling love, be generous and give of your spirit to others. That was beautiful. And please, everyone, if they want to find John, it is marsvenus.com? Yes, that's right. Yeah, Great. And if you want to find... And, and I, I mentioned the best thing at marsvenus.com, besides all the great blogs that my daughter and I have done together, uh, is our course called Understanding Men for Women Only. I understand. And there's a free course there for everybody, but that's the real, the six week course. It's fantastic for women to understand men in a more positive way and get what you want from men. Wonderful, John. And for me, anybody who wants to find out more about me, it's lynnmctaggart.com. And if you're interested in my masterclass, my Power of Eight Intention Masterclass, where I teach you how to become an intention master, but also we put you in groups in your time zone for a year and we work with you for an entire year you want to find out more about that it kicks off february 17th just check out my website lynnmctaggart.com john thank you so much you've had all kinds of wisdom fascinating we dug down to the nitty-gritty of male and female personalities hormones and and the connection between the two so i hope this was enjoyable for everybody I really enjoyed spending more time with you and hope to see you again, John. Thank you, Lynn. Look forward to seeing you again, too. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye, everybody. Bye.